um, at 1.30 in order to give everyone an hour off for lunch. So any questions for our panel? Please, Dr. Collin. So for the uh, simultaneous PET MR, I was wondering, um, for the um, PMT versus the APD, what photon count difference do you think you would get in the end? Uh, is there a good way to characterize how much SNR loss you will get? Uh, you mean the, the MR effect on the PET scanner? Or no, do just you want to try and compare the APTs and the PMTs? The latter. Yeah. Uh, because the APD is a silicon detector, it's not, so the basically the the gain is not so high as PMTs. It, so it will introduce some you need extra electronics to process the signals. But because we used LSO array to convert the gamma to photons, so this part is same. So the difference is the APD's gain is lower. So we need some extra e electronics to amplify the signals. So we already uh, quantified the, the final data there that I didn't show here. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Lowe, could I ask you, uh, with regards to um, the, um, the, the types of imaging that you all are doing, how do you feel that some of the technologies that you saw with Dr. Uh, Ma's work could fit into cardiology and further uh, imaging, uh, especially with regards to how you're doing the valvuloplasties? and not having people exposed to you know, radiation or maybe as much radiation or even pre-planning pre that, that type of intervention? You know, his technology is so high-tech and medicine in general is not that sophisticated except from a research arena. And while I think it'd be great from a practical standpoint, you know, I think it's more really a research tool for us. You know, we use spiral CT now to get our measurements um, in the LV outflow tract, the annulus, the coronary sinus, and the aortic me measurements, and it's better than echo. Plus, we can get height measurement as well. But, I mean, that technology is incredible. And as a research tool, I mean, it has incredible opportunities in cardiology. Do we do CT angio here? Or, I'm sorry. So I... I think the tool we, we have is good for like training and education for um, the um, uh, surgical planning for them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it was very impressive. I was very impressed. Um, I, you know, I had actually a question. Is there anything that can be done to make MR a quicker acquisition and processing? Uh, for the acquisition, yeah, it's limited the the because the sensitivity is low. So it cannot, uh, if you want to acquire a good quality image, I mean a high resolution image, that can be done so quickly. I see. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you all, thank you to our panelists. And, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Harry, sorry about that, sir. Is it, can you hear me? Yeah. As someone who spent many years sharing a cold room with x-ray crystallographers who patiently waited for their proteins to crystallize, I was fascinated to hear your uh, characterization of a flow cytometric method of, of doing x-ray crystallography or of x-ray diffraction studies on individual molecules. How do you control, you mentioned that you, you orient them using either a magnetic or electrostatic uh, focusing, but how do you handle the two separate degrees of freedom, rotation in both an XY and a ZY plane, so that those molecules are lined up and the diffraction patterns are consistent? Yeah, so there's actually two different projects ongoing there. One of them, the one that will be done with the X-ray free electron laser at, at Stanford, is not attempting to orient them at all. They're just going to acquire all the imaging, all the images, and then they look for features in those images to re-register them. The second process, which is called serial diffractometry, which is being pioneered by one of our colleagues, uh, John Spence from University of Arizona, his he uses a laser actually, to, which is a polarized laser to orient these molecules one at a time as they drop in front of the X-ray beam from uh, from a linac. Any other questions? Okay, so again, thank you all to our panelists very much, and.